And then I've been in the AI industry, you know, dating back into the 80s and very active the last decade. So I appreciate Tyler asking me to speak to you tonight. And part of this presentation I gave in New Mexico at a meeting several years ago, but we try to focus on what makes us successful and, and ultimately profitable when we talk about AI. And we're gonna gear this towards project tappers and, and kind of wind up the evening talking about how we maybe could apply it at home for some of your larger operations or, or even those of you who got a smaller cow herd, uh, how we might apply that. And I'm gonna ask Tyler to interject whenever he needs to, to ask questions. If we've got immediate questions we wanna address. Sounds great. You can go right ahead there, sir. Perfect. So as, as I indicated, we're going to talk about show heifers and then we'll get into the cow herds a little bit later. Uh, when I think about AI and I, I talk to customers about this all the time, um, it's a program you kind of got to be in for the long term. And it'd be similar to feeding cattle. Uh, it's not something you jump in and out of. It's something that you have to have as a goal long-term. You gotta do it for five or six or seven years and see, to see the ramifications of how, how it applies. And I think it has to be a well-rounded program. It just doesn't stand out there by itself uh, in terms of advancing your operation or your genetics. It takes, it takes more than that. I'm just gonna briefly touch on these four areas. And then we're gonna talk more about how it applies to specific show heifer implementation. And so we'll start off talk, talking about nutrition. And this applies to your cow herd at home. You always wanna keep track of body condition score throughout the year. Uh, I like to see that monitored, you know, starting in the fall at preg test time, and then again at pre-calving. And use that as a monitor to see where your cow herd's at nutritionally. I'm a firm believer in you can't catch up from the day of cow calves until you're going to try either to breed her naturally or to breed her with artificial insemination. The only time you've got to catch up nutritionally and improve body condition scores from the time a cow weans a calf until she calves the next time. Uh, when we talk about those virgin heifers or heifers we're going to breed for the first time, I think it's very important, you know, more at the ranch than when we're talking about show heifers specifically, but we got to have them to an adequate weight. And there's quite a bit of discussion on that more recently. You know, the school that I taught, you know, when I was at Oregon State University was that they need to be somewhere around 65% of their body weight. Um, where I live in the West, most of the time, we probably breed heifers that are a little less than that. We probably are closer to 55%. Nature tends to select on those that are most fertile. As you're working with the cattle from a nutrition standpoint, I think it's important that you either keep those cattle, and I'm talking probably cows and even young heifers, on a plane of nutrition as level or increasing so they're always on the game. Uh, when you try to take cattle and take them backwards or on a cow that's slipping condition, uh, the reproductive performance of that animal is always compromised. So if you can bring them up steadily and keep them advancing or keep it in a level, uh, you're gonna have a lot more success with your program when it comes to AI or natural service. Just some basics on herd health, and this could probably be a whole presentation in itself. Uh, when we talk about vaccines, you know, the, the minimum we talk about is 30 days prior to breeding. And I'm probably a bigger proponent of somewhere between 45 and 60 days prior to breeding, uh, depending on the products that you use uh, to protect for Vibrio, Lepto, all those kind of uh, uh, vaccines that we're trying to get into these cattle prior to the breeding season. In terms of application to, and this is probably more at the ranch, but it probably applies to show heifers too, 
it's probably worth doing a pre-breeding exam rectally, find out how advanced the reproductive tract of that female is in these virgin heifers. Uh, make sure that you find follicles that are functional and you know can get a heifer pregnant down the road. And, and if you want more information on that, the University of Missouri has done a super job with a program called Show Me Select. And there's actually training that goes on out there uh, with working with veterinarians to, to be more proficient in that track scoring. Uh, just be observant, especially, you know, when you're feeding cattle out in the cow herd or if you're feeding your show heifers and you got them in a group, start watching for those extra signs of heat. You know, our part of the world, we're more of a January, February calving. So you need to see them have for cycling through the winter. And we'll talk about this here in just a minute. Be able to map that. Those of you that have smaller herds like I do, we run about 75 cows. I pretty much have a, on a calendar when every cow cycles prior to breeding season. What that allows you to do is we're leading into this next statement. When you're talking about synchronization, if that's the route you're going to go, you're going to know if a cow's cycled before you start. And, you know, our parameter most of the time is that we're not going to try and synchronize an AI breed a set of cows that aren't at least 40 days postpartum when you start the protocol. As we talk about this a little later, that would make them somewhere around 50 days postpartum when you do the actual insemination. Um, facilities, you know, it, this is probably one of the things that is, I find a lot of importance in. Uh, it makes for a real smooth operation when you're trying to do these breeding projects or even working with a, a single animal. Uh, you just want something the cattle are more comfortable with, something they flow through easy. Um, I always encourage people to make sure everything's sort of in tip top shape, no sharp edges or nails sticking out. Maybe that doesn't necessarily affect your AI conception, but it, it, it maybe doesn't offer the most comfort to the animal if, um, you know, if they get lacerations or poked going through the process. Uh, when we're talking about breeding cattle that are maybe not on the halter, when we're breeding cows out in the, you know, out in a larger setting, I think it's always important that the cattle have some access to adequate feed and water, uh, whether we're trying to gather them in or we're holding them in a dry lot. And probably this bottom one is speaks volumes. Sometimes you can have the fanciest, most up-to-date welded pipe trail, and if the cattle don't use it well, it's not very efficient. Uh, some of the most efficient facilities I've been around um, are very, very simple and the cattle handle very well and flow very, very effectively. So the animal uh, handling thing, how important is that in this situation there, Clint? From my standpoint, I mean, the, the animal handling keeps the cattle calm. Uh, it allows for efficiency. So if we're talking about larger projects where we're time breeding, um, uh, if the cattle are on the muscle or a little hyped up, you don't have as much success in terms of, of conception rate. And you can take cattle that are a little attitude wise that are a little higher strung. And if they're handled correctly, they don't seem to elevate in temperature. You know, as a technician, when I, you can almost tell as a technician how the cattle have been handled. You'll pick up a difference in rectal temperature when you when you go ahead and palpate the cattle. And so from my standpoint, I really like to try and get the animal handling right. Now, if we're talking about a show heifer, a block and shoot, most of them are pretty docile, pretty easy to get along. As long as you could get them in a block and shoot, I breed a lot of heifers for our 4-H members that way, or even tied up to a trailer with those drop down bars. They're pretty docile, but in the general population of our cow herds, 
they're not quite that gentle. Does that answer your question? Okay, so in general, we'll talk about synchronization and the AI process. Uh, when we're visiting with a customer, whether they're breeding one cow or, you know, a thousand cows, we try and get a calendar laid out and have an agenda so each person on the team understands what's, what's expected of them, what dates are coming up, and what they're expected to do. And we try to go through understanding of the program and what hormones are utilized and when they need to be given. And then I really encourage this because this is probably the one of the places that toes get stubbed or we fall down on protocols is people tend to wait till the last minute to order the semen that they want. And we're like right on the edge of shippers showing up. Same thing happens with, with the drugs and cedars involved. So plan that ahead of time as much as possible. And if you're not, if you're not synchronizing, uh, just have it planned out so you're ready when those animals come into heat, if you're just doing a heat detected breed. And I encourage people to use heat aids, and I say I can show half hair and and uh, you don't really want that glue in there. So observation can be your heat aid. Check those heifers, you know, all the time. So you know the next time she's going to come in heat. I'd like you to know if she's an 18-day heat cycle or if she's 22 days. Um, just keep that on a calendar. Keep good records of that. And then as we talk about AI and the breeding season, and I'm going to give this two folds. Post AI management is important. So if we're in the cow herd and we use up all our, you know, we're one day AI, we use up all our feed around the corrals just to make that process happen because it's handy. And then we take them out, turn them out on lush pasture. Uh, we made such a change there that. You know, we see that, and that's the next statement here. He's got a sudden change in nutrition that can really alter your conception rate. So have a plan how you're going to handle them before you start the AI, really out there about 60 days after AI. In the case, if you have to transport cattle, like loading them on a semi or even trailers to take them, take them out to pastures, now, the best time to do that is within four days of the insemination process. And if all possible, don't change what's going on with those cattle nutritionally, management wise, uh, fly control, running them through the chute. Try to have all that done so you can just let the cattle settle, settle and be still for about 45 days post breeding. And we'll get into this in the show heifer side of things, but it's probably just as important there as it is out in, in the larger cow herds. So any questions so far before I dive off into talking more about project heifers and, and how we implement AI? We got any questions in the chats or anything, Tyler? So far, I'm not seeing anything other than just uh, the availability at the end. So I think you can keep on going here, Clint. Okay, perfect. So when, when I think about show heifers and I just preference, the, I judge a lot of county fairs. I got the opportunity and been blessed to judge a few national shows and got to judge quite a few state shows. And I, I know how serious all of you take putting together a nice show heifer or steer to take down the road. So, you know, we all want to get in the purple and, and, you know, be successful. So before you get too far into the season, I mean, find, have a plan, kind of what shows you're really going to focus on and, you know, how early in the show season are those shows. And if you're going to have to transport cattle in, different adverse conditions you know cattle generally handle the cold better than they do the heat uh, a lot of times when you go out 
go to these junior nationals in the summer or late state fairs in the summer. You're just dealing with, unless you're going like the Grand Island, Nebraska, you're dealing with a lot of adverse conditions for those animals. And it really plays a big role in keeping those, keeping those heifers pregnant. So lay out that roadmap, decide where you're gonna go, and then work backwards and come up with a plan how to, how to get those heifers bred. So I know in your part of the world, Tyler, and you have some of those winter shows, you know, you just got done with the Black Hill Stock Show not too long ago. I, um, so those heifers are obviously open during that time frame, and if you're not going to go out and hit any state or regional shows till May or June, this is probably an opportune time to make a plan to get your heifer pregnant. And there may be questions come come from the crowd as we get into the discussion later. Is like, well, I really don't want a heifer to calve at Christmas time. Well, the, those are decisions you have to make. Uh, for yourself, if you want to be competitive and you want that heifer to be productive as a cow, you may have to get her to calve earlier than, than you normally would manage your other cows. And that way, when you get into the heat of the summer, you've got a pregnant female and not one you're trying to get pregnant. So we go back, you know, we go back to traveling. Uh, through these winter shows and, you know, try and map that heat cycle. Every time you take one out, it doesn't matter if it's a heifer or a gilt or lamb. It seems like you take them to a show when they're young and stress them out. Either they come into heat right there at the show or they're in heat right after that. So be aware of that. Be aware of the signs of what heat would look like, especially if if you only got one animal, I mean, they may show signs of heat towards you as a human. Uh, look for the signs of some extra mucus coming out of their vulva. Uh, some heifers are just overly aggressive. We have a heifer, red Angus heifer, that we're going to show some in the summer and then on a bed on red show in November. And you don't have to question when that heifer's in heat. She balls, walks the fence, tries to crawl through the fence to get in with other cattle if you've got her separated. So I, I would really encourage you to be aware of what your individual heifer is like when she comes into heat. And it becomes more obvious when you got her mixed with different groups of heifers or maybe with the project steer and start reporting those behaviors now. So as we get ready to say, if we're going to have them heifers calve in February, by the time May comes around, we know, we know where we're at. Sure. Hey, Clint, how, how long is your cycle? I don't know if you mentioned that. Yeah. A normal cycle. cycle is 21 days. Yeah. A normal cycle is 21 days, but it can range from 18 to 23. And there's not really any particular you know, animal that kind of stays in a particular cycle range. So I, I always try and watch for that next heat. If I observe it, you know, basically we're March one today. If a heifer's in heat today, I start watching for her to recycle somewhere March 16th to 17th. And I observe her pretty close for four or five days. And if you look at what we do on the dairy side, we've got piles and piles of data on those cows and when they come into heat and there's not a perfect trend but 21 days is just a common common average good Thank question you. so the bottom statement talks about body condition and managing fat uh, and this this goes back to kind of growing heifers slowly you know i know you got you want to get them big enough to be competitive i know you want to get the right kind of condition on them to be competitive but the, the toughest animal there is to get pregnant doesn't matter if we're talking about heifers on the halter 
or heifers at the feed bunch. Is a heifer that gets starts getting excessively fat. And you see the fat showing up in their udder around their tail head. Um, you know, those are things to manage early and try and keep them. I'm not telling you to lean them up, but keep them as fresh in terms of their condition as possible. So you have opportunity to get them bred. The interesting thing, uh, the interesting thing about heifers is once they get pregnant they really get easy to get fat and so if you can get them pregnant early on then you can do lots of things to help increase increase weight performance get that extra center body feel because you're going to be carrying that pregnancy you can do it with less energy uh, and you can keep the animals looking fresher as a judge, it's a real challenge for me when you get an animal that's got a lot of brisket, pone, and udder fat. You know, she just got pushed. Maybe she was the most competitive, you know, heifer, you know, early on. But later, later on, she's not as competitive because she doesn't have that fresh appearance. So I go back to this statement I made earlier is that if my advice would be is get these heifers settled between now when you're kind of done with your winter shows or your your early spring shows and before you head out to start doing your summer shows or jackpots and if it's anything in your area like it is here once we kick off in the month of may there's a jackpot show every weekend sometimes two jackpot shows on any given weekend and the cattle have to endure a lot of stress the hauling the heat up and down you know if the cattle aren't conditioned to be up and standing for lots of hours um, it's tough to maintain a pregnancy i've been involved with nationally competitive heifers that we AI'd them on the way on the trailer on the way to junior nationals. They were still trying to get them pregnant in July. So really encourage you to get them pregnant, get them pregnant primarily somewhere around 45 or 60 days before you want to really take them out and get them in a competitive class. And why I say 60 days is if we say that we're going to take our first competitive show is June 1. If we get that heifer pregnant, you know, we'll try to catch her heat in AI or April 1. We got 60 days till our first show. So she should have a chance to settle. If she doesn't settle, then we're going to catch her again somewhere you know, mid, late April and have a second chance to get her pregnant. She's going to be somewhere in that 40 day range before she goes out into, into some of those stresses that we have hauling cattle down the road and, and being out in the environment, especially if you have cattle in coolers at home. So it helps maintain her pregnancy if we can get that accomplished early. And some of you that show and those of you judge, I, I mean, this is my perspective. You know, those heifers that are kept fresh all through this early part of their show season, they're maybe not quite as competitive as show heifers if they're a little bit greener. When you get them pregnant early, then you have the opportunity to add a lot more fill to them and use that pregnancy to improve body capacity. Uh, you'll start to see their udders start to fill up and have that realistic look in terms of tea quality, udder dimension and fill. Uh, it's real hard to get an open heifer to express that, you know, on the later shows and the state fairs. So the, this is just my perspective. It's easier to get one pregnant early, try and keep her fresh. You don't always have to use quite as much energy and she will do it naturally with a pregnancy on board. 
you know, as you go into those competitive shows. And I keep, I keep coming back to this, but just have a plan. Work at it 60 to 45 days before. If, if you have a technician that'll help you, or if you're doing it yourself, I would really encourage you to catch the heifers in a natural heat and AI before you start trying to do synchronization. Now, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, if synchronization is the only way, then we'll have to utilize that to, to the best of our advantage. Use any heat detection aids you can. You know, if you're, if you got quite a bit of hair on the cattle, we use Estratech patches on all kinds of cattle. They, they do take some hair out. I know that, uh, you know, you can probably use some kind of paint. Some of the paints we have come off when they come into heat, rub off. So if you're, you know, using tail paint and you apply it every two or three days to make sure it's fresh, make sure you catch those heifers in heat and a good strong heat. So with that tail paint here, Clint, you just go, what, over the tail head and then kind of right over the hooks? Yeah, so... And really, if you just got it right over the tail paint, right over their tail head, this is kind of a powdery, leaves a film on them. Like if you got a black heifer, a lot of times we use pink or orange paint and you just put it on there, kind of have some of an oil base. I usually try to make a, looks like a, a X or a T right over the top. And that way, if, if they're a little bit higher in their tail set, you know, they'll rub off the sides. They may not rub off the middle. Because heifers get kind of fatter or a real heavy muscled heifer, they may not rub right off over the tail head. Versus like using grease chalk, then you got to get that out of their hair later on. And sometimes that's a little tougher to do than if you just use that paint, tail paint. It gives you indication and it's easy to apply again. Uh, you know, as you breed them, or if you're not sure of the heat, you could throw some on. The one thing I would talk about heat detection aids is you got to think about the environment around the heifers. Uh, if they can go out and rub on the trees or anything, just to give you an example. I gave Estermate shot, which is across the gland to bring heifers in heat. I gave it on Sunday and I threw an Estertech patch on. Well, I already got one heifer that they had access to go down my working alley to go. She goes in there and works back and forth until she rips the Estratec tag right off her back. So you kind of have to eliminate any tree branches or anything they could go under, dust bags or oilers, because they'll, they'll rub that off and they'll fool you on what's natural heat. There's sure. nothing Clint, better than having one animal ride another. For heat detection where can you pick this stuff up from like the paint for heat uh where, what do you look for as far as the farm store or yeah what what do you look for with the paint i know you said the powdery stuff um can you just use regular paint and where where do you purchase the stuff you're talking about here uh regular paint won't do the job i mean if you're working with an ai company a lot of them have what we just call tail paint like in the dairy business, we use piles of it. You know, it's or like the construction paint you see people have around that you can turn upside down and make lines, like even for baseball. That paint works fine. It has a powder coat, it'll stick to the hair, it's not greasy. Just a regular spray can paint that you would use to rattle can something, that won't work. So, that that that's a good question just make sure it kind of leaves that powdery film on the animal when you first put it on and make sure you have enough color differentiation like you got a red heifer you probably better use blue paint or something that you can see pretty easy other questions on that i think that covers it thank you perfect 
you're going to get tired of hearing this, but you know, you got to continue to plan, plan, and plan. And this probably become, this comes from a technician standpoint. Like if you're trying to get heifers pregnant and you want your local technician to help you out in the springtime, that's probably their busiest time of the year. So if you're going to do that in May, I'd encourage you to already be talking to the technician, tell them what kind of project you got going on make that plan and have it ready to go and you know just like i'm saying we're at least two months out from that happening three months in some of your your cases um keep these heifers coming on the game and you know basically a lot of times when i judge shows i see both ends of the spectrum on these these heifer calves we're trying to bring them into the breeding season you got heifer calves that are too fat already. And so you're kind of having in a holding stage and you have heifer calves that have probably been turned out or just getting real low quality or average quality grass hay or alfalfa and not much energy. And so they're on, on the thin side. And so you've got, if, you're, if your target breeding time is May, you got plenty of time to work on your nutrition in the next 60 to 90 days, you can start increasing her on a plane of nutrition. Or if that heifer is starting to get, get a little chubby, you can keep her maintained, maybe add some more forage back into her diet, high quality forage, get a little more protein in it. Uh, just always plan and have a continuous plan of how I can get this heifer pregnant. There is a I think I was sharing with Tyler last night when I coached coached a team. There was a pair of twin shorthorn heifers, and one of them was champion at Kansas City, and one was champion in Louisville. And then the the same one was also champion in in Denver. And of those two heifers, only one of them was pregnant the whole time. And the one that did the most winning was kind of open the most time that she showed and from a practical cowman standpoint, that's really not what this project's about. We really like these show heifers to end up the cow herd and be productive down the road. So if we can manage how they, they gain and how they put on condition, that, that leads to successful conception in terms of AI breed. All right, Clint, are we ready to roll, it, ready to roll into some, uh, some protocols and go through some different things that way? Yep, we're real up. close to that. You know, we just we'll go to uh, knowing whether we're going to heat detect or or AI, and so there's different protocols: um, heat detect and AI, or do a timed appointment. So there's protocols that that land differently for that. And we'll talk about. Um, if we're not just heat detecting and having our technician come out and breed when we observe in the heat, uh, we're going to use some protocols that we could use to, to bring the cattle into heat at a specific time and make arrangements for a technician to be there and breed. So can everybody see this screen okay? Tyler, you see the screen? Yep, you're good. Yeah, we got the VFF for protocols for heat detection and timed AI. Yeah, it gets pretty bright here with this white background. So I would I would encourage you, those that um, have a pretty good idea of when your heifer is cycling or when her normal heat cycle is, I would encourage you to use what we call the select sink plus seeder or commonly called the seven day protocol. And that's the, uh, the two protocols on the left side of your screen. Um, they're shorter term protocols and they're very effective, okay? So the top one, if you're gonna discuss that, uh, let's say you know that your heifer is gonna be in heat typically on March 7th. We would start by putting a cedar in her today or tomorrow. And with the GNRH product like Fertigil, we'd leave it in for seven days. So if we did that today, that's a Tuesday. 
the following Tuesday, we would remove the cedar and give her a shot of prostaglandin, which is common name would be like lutease or estrogen. And then you would observe heat for up to 84 hours. Or if you can't really, you gotta have ignition and he's pretty tight or she's pretty tight with their time, they can only be there a certain day. Then we would look at this bottom protocol where it says that we can breed around 54 hours or, or 22 to 24 hours after that. So you would basically set up a time with them. So when you would pull the, the cedar in the early morning and you would be, a, you would arrange for that technician there to be there in the afternoon, two days later. So if that's on a Tuesday, you would arrange for the technician to be there Thursday afternoon to do a time deployment. In the business that I'm in, I probably discourage you from doing that. I would do as much heat detection if, if your technician will allow, you know, to make sure you have the right kind of success. Because heifers, they're probably the least consistent in the way they cycle. On these seven day protocols, you'll have heifers come in as early as 28 hours after you pull the cedar and all the way out to almost 100 hours after you pull the cedar. So there's a pretty wide window. I'd really encourage you to breed the heifer when she's in standing heat. If you don't, um, your success is gonna go down. I'm gonna briefly talk about these protocols on the right side. These would be called long-term protocols. They take a lot more planning. As you can see on the bottom axis on both protocols, you're, those are days from day zero to day 36 with the MGA protocol. And with the 14 day cedar, you're from day zero to day 33. So for example, if you're gonna breed the 5th of May, you're gonna start your, your protocol somewhere around the 1st of April. So from a standpoint of planning, you can see how important it is for me to bring up having a calendar and having everybody on board. The hey, Clint, one question. Go ahead, Tyler. I was, I was going to say, they were curious, or somebody was wondering, is there a percentage advantage between the seven versus 14? Yeah, let me finish. Let me finish. Okay, this. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you're good. Let me finish a comment here, and then we'll go back and forth between those things. So the one advantage and as a, for the job that I do, I recommend the bottom right protocol to a lot of my producers. And this is why. Um, you know, heifers, they go through the winter, and like the winter you guys have had in the Dakotas, Nebraska, and that area, it's been a tough winter. And there's been a lot of ups and downs condition. You probably have not observed a lot of heat in your virgin heifers. The advantage of this protocol, these two protocols on the right is with either MGA or the cedar, uh, you're gonna you're gonna have those heifers have a heat cycle somewhere where you see on the axis day 14, somewhere around day 17, 18, and 19, those heifers are gonna have a heat. And a lot of times those heats are not fertile. So don't be tempted to breed the heifers on that heat. What it does is make sure that that heifer's reproductive tract from the standpoint of maturity and follicles on the ovary that's preparing them for the next heat that you're gonna induce on day 30 or 33 when you give them a prostaglandin shot. And the neat part about these two is I, I alluded to in the seven day, you had a wide range of heats from somewhere around 28 hours following cedar removal out to 96 or 100 hours after. 
these two protocols tighten that up. If somewhere you'll start seeing observed heat somewhere around 48 hours following the last shot. And usually it only goes out to about 90 hours. So it narrows the time frame that you're going to observe heat. Okay. So back to your question, Tyler, and make sure I got this right. Is there a big advantage one way or another to these one protocol or the other? My answer would be is if you know your heifers are cycling throughout the winter, you've got some of those observations in mind. I probably prefer you do a seven day because you can, you already know that your heifer is fertile cycling and you can more effectively time cedar removal somewhere around. 18 to 23 days post your last observed heat. Okay. If those heifers you're working with have not showed any heat cycles in the last 60 days, I'm going to tell you the advantage is use the 14 day cedar protocol. So you know that those, those animals are not silent. You know, the, the disappointing thing about a seven day cedar protocol is if your heifers don't show a sign of heat through aids of heat detection, your success goes way down in terms of conception. In the 14 day protocol, you can actually see a pretty good advantage in conception because you know those heifers have had a previous cycle somewhere around. 15, 16 days before you give them the last shot. So even though you might not see an observed heat when you breed them, their body, their biological uh, clock, if you will, from their brain to the reproductive tract is in line, it's in sync. The ovulation is synchronized. And so you, you're gonna have a little more success in getting one pregnant that's not showing signs of heat. So before I go on to these next ones, I would, I would just make a comment about that. We do a lot of work with Estratech patches and they have a scoring system that's one to five. And the patches that are scored in the three, four and five are somewhere in the 80% range higher becoming pregnant than those that are scored a one or a two. And the ones that are four and five over one, two, and three is more like 90% chance of getting pregnant. So what that tells me is when you see animals in a standing riding heat, your success goes up. So I would shoot for that every time. You know, you're dealing with usually with one animal and maybe you got a steer or another heifer around that's the heat detector try and catch them in the riding heat. Does that answer that question, Tyler? I believe so, yes, sir. Okay, perfect. I had a question on MGA here. Um, so if you, uh, how are you able to tell if you fed the right amount of MGA in terms of, uh, is there a negative for too much or too little for what you feed her? Uh, yeah, okay. So the, make sure I understand the question. MGA has a prescribed amount. And, you know, it comes in two forms. Uh, like on a large scale feedlot, it comes in liquid. And they get so many grams a day per head. And in those situations, the cattle need to get pretty close to that amount one time a day. So the MJ needs to administer, be administered in the AM feeding. The bunk needs to be clean when they deliver the feed. So all the cattle involved have access to the MGA. Okay. And if you were going to use this on a show animal, it also comes in a pelleted form. And in that case, most of the time we encourage them to have the carrier feed, if you will. So 
most companies make a feed that's very similar to the MGA feed that's just minus the hormone. You feed that for about 12 or 14 days before you start them on the day zero with the MGA. And then you go 14 days with the hormone product on course. When you take them off, you switch back to the previous feed for another 14 to 21 days to keep that plain of nutrition even. Um, it's a very good protocol. It uh, is quite a bit cheaper from a commercial standpoint than a cedar, but it does take a lot of detail. You can't be, you can overfeed it and cause like heifers that have got too much condition, it'll stay in the fat and then they don't respond quite as well. If you underfeed it, um we we basically have what we call protocol jumpers you'll go out there one day in the middle of the mj from day zero to 14 and there could be eight or ten heifers out of a hundred heat which tells me that they'd got mj long enough to suppress heat but when they came off they were stimulated to come into heat if that happens you might as well ditch everything that's from day 14 on because it takes away the synchronization part of it. Fair question? Yep. Okay, perfect. So I wanted to show this. This is what we use for fixed time AI. And a lot of times this is for just for uh, larger commercial projects where you're gonna be there one specific day. And if you, your technician only can allow you so much time in their day, you probably need to take a look at these protocols. There is two more protocols on here than what we saw on the previous slide. There's what's called a five day protocol. And I would show you the difference between that and the seven day. The obvious difference is the cedar's only in five days, but the biggest difference and the most, the one that's probably the most important is you have to give them two shots of a prostate gland eight hours apart on that day five. And lots of people say, well, why don't you just double the dose of prostate gland and, and give it once? They've done a little bit of research about that. But it doesn't allow for the synchronization. It'll, the synchronization gets scattered out. You want to give that second shot, you know, eight hours apart. It's not as big a deal with virgin heifers without a calf as it is cow-calf pairs. So the timing here is 60 hours post cedar removal. You'll see on the seven day, which we saw in the previous slide, you're going to breed them somewhere between 54 and plus or minus two hours. MGA, um, I would recommend timed AI on show heifers with this. On the commercial side, large groups of heifers, somewhere between 66 and 84 hours is a good, good way to do that. The 14 day protocol is, I mean, it's the tried and true protocol for synchronizing large group of heifers. You can basically start Say we're doing 500 to 1,000 heifers in a morning, as an example. You can start breeding those heifers about hour 63, and if you're done about hour 66 to 68, your timing is perfect. Okay, this bottom protocol is called the 7 and 7. This is a very new protocol. It's only been really approved for heifer use since this last fall. Uh, I'm going to tell you to proceed with caution. I'm not going to recommend you use this because we don't have a lot of pregnancy data out in the field on it right now. The neat thing about it is we've used it on several medium-sized groups of heifers 
and we see nearly a hundred percent estrus response or riding activity with this protocol. It says time breed at 54 hours. My experience is we've never been able to make it to 54 hours. And if you want to use this protocol, you need to heat detect. And it doesn't have to be morning and night, but I'll just give you an example. We had two groups of about 50 heifers back to back, not this fall, but the previous fall. And we had the earliest heifers were in heat about 28 hours. And the last heifer was in heat at about 40 hours. So if we would have waited till 54 hours to breed those, those early heifers, we would have been on the outside of being able to get them settled. Yeah, question, Tyler. Well, I was gonna say, what uh, what was the map on those heifers? Were they all uh, cycling pretty regular right before you did this protocol or do you have that data? Yeah, I mean, that would be hard for me to answer. The heifers were in really nice condition. Um, I would tell you this is when I put the cedars in those heifers, there's lots of sign of previous activity. And what I mean by that is rubbed off hip bones and roughed up hair on their tail heads. So the response didn't surprise me. And, it, and if you look at the number of days involved, how many hormone shots are on that lower, lower schematic, I mean, you're basically taking total control of that bovine brain. You're not giving them much choice not to have a heat, if you'll follow what I'm saying. I mean, they're almost locked into it. They don't, they really don't have a choice. Okay. So I'll tell you my personal concern with this protocol is just the elevated, and this probably is more in heifers that have a lot of condition on them, is there are a lot of hormones in a 17-day period. And if they don't settle, I, I have a lot of concern that, you know, maybe there would be some, some chance they wouldn't want to respond to those hormones in the future. Fair enough. How are we doing on time, yes. Tyler? We're uh, we got about three minutes till we're supposed to be wrapped up here, Clint. So that'll be perfect. So the last, this last part here is just kind of a little bit about what I do, and a lot of this is pictorial. If I can get this, there we go. So. This is what I see. This is my crystal ball. We're at the lowest cow numbers we've been. And I don't know if anybody here is 80 years old on here today, but those of you at Tyler's age have never seen cow numbers this low. And female retention in the next decade is going to have to be paramount for us to supply a hungry world. And we, we want to search out fertility and try and impact those in those early born, you know, heifers that have been born early in your calving season. Our philosophy is what I do is we work on large projects and our goal is to be able to take our equipment and our crew and our service to any corner of the ranch. So if your feed is in the furthest pasture away and that's where you have to have those cattle, so you can see by these pictures, this is the kind of equipment we have and we use in our area all the time. So we, we pride ourselves in being able to take the business to the cows. I would tell you planning and personnel and good people around is the key to our success. And I think that can apply if you've got one animal you know, your crew, meaning your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your AI technician, have a good work relationship with them and, and you'll be successful. 
one thing I'm lucky enough to do is I get to see some pretty wild, cool views with what I do with my job. This picture here, we're setting up breeding of like 500 cows in a two hour time frame. You can see that there's there's a one barn you can barely see, but there's two AI double barns there, two double Daniels alleys ways. We're breeding somewhere around 200 cows an hour with about 100 cows an hour going through each barn. Another view where we bred right at 800 heifers in about four and a half hours, set up where we're you know, bringing multiple cattle. We got a efficient setup in the back and we've got four people breeding cows and two people fawn semen inside of those closed in farms. And this is kind of one of my favorite slides is how do we implement AI? Like I said, it's a long-term commitment. We got to have communication between all parties involved, total understanding of where we're headed and why we're committed to this. And in our case, we have, in our business, we have to be willing to follow some roads that lead to some great scenery. Okay, we, we really focus on and uh, take pride on trying to have the best results for, for what you have. Um, our slogan is, is your success is our passion. And we really like to be involved and make your operation better. So with that, Tyler, if we're at that point, we can entertain some questions. I really appreciate the opportunity and Maybe the next time in North Dakota doing customer meetings, I'll get to meet some of you. Tyler, this is Kurt Clint. This is Kurt Fraley, County Extension Agent in Dickinson, North Dakota. I, I was monitoring the chat and the Q&A. <clears throat> there was a question from Aaron. What is your experience, opinion of sexed semen? Good question. Um, I think it's something that we don't take a hold of it right now and going into the future, you're leaving a lot of opportunity behind. Um, I'll just tell you the two differences in it that I think are important to know about is it's more fragile to handle. You have to be very, very diligent at knowing your thawing equipment's right on, know about timing and the second one is probably the most important. You did not breed an animal with sex semen unless they're in standing heat. Uh, and when you see them in standing heat, you need to wait a minimum of 18 hours as a general rule, even up to 24 hours following a first observed heat. If you go too early, you're not going to have as much success. Conventional semen is a lot more forgiving. You can breed cows when you see them the first observed sign of heat and have a fairly good success. We do it every day in dairies. So timing is important. Knowing, knowing that when you see that first observed heat, wait, wait, wait until you breed them. Don't use a typical AM, PM rule we're used to with conventional semen. Great question, Kurt. Thank you. There is another question that came through from Samantha. I've never worked with a technician before. What will a technician ask me? What should I think about before I call him? Good question. <clears throat> so if you're not proficient with AI yourself, this is what a technician is going to bring with you, okay? He's going to have a semen tank that stores the semen. So if you buy semen, you're going to have to arrange with that technician to have the semen shipped to him or her and have it stored there. You can expect a technician to bring all the proper equipment to thaw the semen. Um, he should give you advice on these protocols we've talked about today. He, he or she should be timely. And I would say that 
those people's time when you're probably wanting to breed those heifers are very valuable. So you need to have a mind to budget. You know, I would say the technicians I work with to breed one single animal, if they're next door, you're probably looking at 50 bucks a head. If they're 30, 40, 50 miles down the road, it could cost you $150 a head. So I would say be aware of that. Good question. Thank you, Kurt. Another one just popped up. Does my show heifer need a natural cycle before I can AI? That's a great question. Uh, my advice is I would, I would like to see her have at least one natural cycle before you try to AI. And the reason I say that is we don't really know when she started puberty. And if, if her first cycle is the one you observe, the chances of you getting her settled on that may only be about 40, 50%. Versus if you wait one more cycle, you may up your chances of conception as much as 10 to 15% on natural heat. Another good question. To follow that up. Kurt, one minute here. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, before we start losing too many people on our uh, webinar this evening, want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, as Kurt mentioned earlier, uh, we will get this uh, the recording put up on YouTube. Uh, we do have a couple webinar uh, or a couple questions that we would ask that you would uh participate in answering before you jump off. So if you need to jump off, uh, know that the recording will be up shortly. Uh, we do have time for a couple more questions if you wanna stick on and ask those questions. We have one more, at least in the chat box, so. Brian, I do see the, uh, the poll that did pop up. So going back to our question, um, how well does seven and seven sync work on cows? or is there a better protocol for cows? Great question. I'm gonna start by saying, you need to make sure your cows are ready for a seven and seven. Seven and seven is a lot of extra work. So it's one more time through the shoot. But if you've got your cows in a good body condition and they've got some cyclicity ahead of time, it's not uncommon for us to see cows in the range of 90, you know, high 80s up to high 90s percent cycling off of the protocol. If you get that, you could expect as much as a 10 to 15 percent jump in overall conception rate. On the flip side, if you're trying to, to, to bump up and get a higher conception rate and you maybe don't have the cows in the right kind of condition or they're short on energy, uh, don't waste your time. Stay with a seven and seven protocol, or a, excuse me, a normal seven day protocol. That answer their question? I believe so. They haven't followed up with anything. And I guess uh, I just looked at the Q&A part. There's nothing in there. And I think unless Brian or Tyler, um, somebody else has seen anything, I think we've uh, got all the questions that have been typed in uh, out to you. Perfect. I, I would entertain any. I told Tyler I wouldn't put any punches in for working for select sires but if people wanted to reach out to me via email or a phone call if you do have a select sires beef directory my contact information is there in the front and the back of that catalog tyler are, are you still with us tyler I absolutely, I absolutely am. So if you guys have not uh, filled out the poll, it would be greatly appreciated just to get a little gauge of, of where we, uh, you know, if there's any other questions you guys have, uh, please also uh, bring those up. And I'm actually in the process of pulling up the, uh, 
the series that we're going to have so that way you guys can tune in for the uh, next four that we will have available here. So we'll give it a couple more minutes here. If any other questions come to mind and uh, we'll stick on here a couple more minutes and wait for those. Again, like Tyler said, uh, if you haven't uh, done the webinar poll, we'd ask you to do that uh, before you jump off. Uh, again, we will come with another webinar next weekend uh, or next Tuesday evening. And Tyler just pulled that up on your screen there. So uh, and next week, uh, this week we talked about the artificial insemination and synchronization protocols. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, the natural breeding services. So uh, just going a little different uh, direction there. Uh, after that, we're going to get into the, our nutrition uh, for post-calving and pre-breeding nutrition, some show animal nutrition later on in March, and our, we'll wrap it up with the uh, grazing ready, readiness, hoping we'll start to see some uh, light at the end of our winter here, and uh, we can start looking at some getting cattle ready to go out and graze. So uh, there's our schedule for the next uh, four weeks with our webinars Tuesday evening, starting at 6.30 Central Time. And we encourage anyone, if you know other people that would like to uh, jump onto these webinars, uh, get them sent over to get registered and uh, can use the same link uh, each week to get on. So. So Brian and Tyler, there was another question that popped into the, okay, Clint did add, answer it. How many times should I try AI before I move to natural service? And Clint, uh, that guy that asked the question is a very famous guy, I think sheep business. <laughs> um, I did answer it. I, what I do with my own heifers, if you do have the natural bull available, I try them a couple of times AI and then I go to natural. And my main thought process is thinking down the road, if you're trying to have that heifer pregnant going into the competitive part of the show season, a pregnant heifer is better than an open one. And sometimes AI just doesn't work for every animal. I'll, I'll see and oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'll throw it back to Brian and Tyler to wrap up the evening. Well, Tyler, I don't see any more questions coming in and we're starting to lose some of our participants. So uh, on behalf of our uh, 4-H animal science uh, program, and we just as we say that, we do have another question that pops in. Uh, do you think that an animal that doesn't easily breed AI is a good option to call? I, I would call one. Some of the best cows I've seen in the business in terms of raising big calves. Uh, you know, if you breed them the first time AI, they may stick the next time to natural service and raise a strapping big bull calf. You know, some of them disposition wise or something just doesn't work in that process. And so I, I'm not one that would call that one. Okay. Well, on behalf of our 4-H uh, animal science team here in North Dakota, we want to thank everyone for participating this evening. We want to thank Clint for uh, providing his insights to the uh, artificial insemination and uh, sync protocols. Tyler, for lining this up. Uh, I hope you guys join us again next week, uh, Tuesday evening, 6.30 for our natural breeding uh, service webinar. So. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank you.
Tyler, we probably can end recording.